Ted Reinstein comes from the Metro West. He's a longtime reporter, producer, and anchor for Chronicle TV program on WCVB TV, which is the nation's longest running locally produced TV news magazine, and it's 32nd session, uh, season now, I believe. Uh, Ted joined in 1995 as a reporter and a producer, and he's covered many stories in New England through the years. And in 2002, he was part of a team that covered the Big Dig story and received the National DuPont Columbia Broadcast Journalism Award. Ted has also served on the editorial board uh, on the station and writes a weekly opinion column. He's a contributor to WCVB political roundtable on the record, um, and he has hosted Discovery Channel's Popular Mechanics show. He also has published political cartoons and has a strong love for the theater in both acting and as a playwright. He has performed uh, in plays in New York and Boston, and uh, recently he has co-authored uh, the play Yom Kippur in Da Nang. As he has spent a lot of time working in the field for Chronicle, he's been to many corners of New England uh, telling stories of the people, which led to his first book, A New England Notebook. And he is here today to show a few, to share a few of his favorite stories from that book. So please give me, get, help me give a warm welcome to Ted Reinstein. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you for having me here today, folks. Um, as Cheryl said, I uh, have been a reporter for um, Chronicle, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, is uh, a nightly news magazine uh, on Boston's ABC affiliate, uh, WCVB. And uh, I have been a feature reporter for Chronicle for 20 years now and uh, have reported from every corner in New England, and um, one of the frustrations uh, over the years uh, in doing the show for me, while I love it, and uh, and because I know that no one connected with my job, never mind my boss is here, I can say that it is the best job that I could possibly have. For someone with adult ADD, it is perfect. <laughs> it's It changes all the time. I'm not sitting in an office most of the time. Um, but... So when we go away and do a show for Chronicle, um, and I'm happiest when we're on the road, um, we go away for four or five days, and we come back with about two and a half hours uh, of video footage. And that has to be shrunk down and edited and cut down to the half hour that is Chronicle. Well, that's the dirty little secret, the 15 minutes that's Chronicle, right? Yeah, it's... yeah. The other 15 minutes is the stuff that keeps Chronicle on the air. So uh, you, you have to cut down a lot. And um, when we put together a show, we try to include a fair amount of variety, but there are always one or two stories that have drawn you to wherever it is you're going. And then you find some other things to round out some variety for that particular half hour. And 15 minutes. And... Um, over the years, it started to become really frustrating to me, the TV medium, in the sense that you have to shrink it down to 15 minutes. And that's including different stories. And so the one or two stories that really drew you there have to be cut down accordingly as well. And, and, and I got really frustrated over the years that um, so many stories that I would have loved to have gone the entire show with, the whole week with, a multi-part series, if they would let me had to be shrunk down to sometimes one segment of that 15 minutes, so like five minutes. And over the years, I started to watch these files build up in my office, both at home and at, and at work, uh, because I don't throw any of my notes away. Thank God I didn't. And, um, and I became determined over the years to find some other outlet, platform, format to tell some of these stories and give some more time to some of these stories that I had never been able to do in TV. And that's where the book comes from. Um, 
New England Notebook, One Reporter, Six States, Uncommon Stories, is really, it's kind of a, an orphanage in a way for these homeless little stories that <laughs> begged for more love and then finally got it. <laughs> so this is, uh, I thought what I'd do is read you, you know, you've been sitting for a long time, so I, I'm not going to read two stories. This is a fairly long one. Um, I mean, we'll be done by dinner, but it's... Uh, it's actually my favorite story. You know, I'm often asked, both in relation to my, my long years of reporting for Chronicle and the book, if I have a favorite story. You know, if there's one favorite story that I would count as my all-time favorite from anywhere in New England. And um, I, I, I'm always, I, I always answer that with a four-letter word, F-R-E-D. Um, anybody ever heard of Fred Tuttle? So maybe some some murmuring memory. Yeah, it's been a while. But suffice it to say that if we were gathered right now in Enosburg Falls or Montpelier or St. Johnsbury or Brattleboro, Vermont, it would be as if I had just asked, does everybody remember our favorite beloved uncle? Because that's really what Fred Tuttle represented to an entire generation of Vermonters. He is Vermont's most beloved folk hero, and that's including you know, Ben and Jerry's, um, who they would be happy and do cede that to Fred Tuttle. Um, and he is Vermont's most famous former dairy farmer, which may not sound like much in a place like Hopkinton, relatively urban, but in a place like Vermont that counted more cows than people till the 1960s, it's kind of a big deal. But Fred Tuttle is my favorite all-time story. He is my favorite New England character of all time. Um, he was a former dairy farmer, and he was a movie star. And this is uh, my take on Fred Tuttle. It's in a chapter in the book called The People of New England, and the chapter is called Vermont Folk Hero. By the time he was 75, Fred Tuttle had become Vermont's most famous dairy farmer. No small achievement in a state that until the 1960s, as I just said for no apparent reason, because it's right here, kind of more cows than people. Or for a retired dairy farmer at that, with no herd and a falling down barn. He also had poor eyesight, a mouthful of marbles, a gimpy gait, a balky heart, and a hip that needed replacing. But then it wasn't milking cows that made Fred Tuttle a folk hero. When we first met Fred in 1996, we stopped by his hometown of Tunbridge, Vermont on a chilly fall Vermont afternoon and chatted for a bit on a hilly windswept patch of old pasture land overlooking this little green mountain town. We were intrigued by the buzz surrounding the recently released Vermont-based independent film, Man with a Plan. We were even more curious in tracking down its unlikely star. In Fred Tuttle, we found him. I asked him what he thought, what his wife thought of the movie. Hasn't seen it yet, he said flatly, poking some leaves with his cane. No, I said in disbelief. Nope, not once. Fred's friend, neighbor, and the film's writer and director, John O'Brien, stood by, smiling at the exchange. I'm sure Dottie will see it eventually, right, Fred? He nudged softly. Why? She says she sees enough of me already. <laughs> I don't know how much Fred liked dairy farming, but after five minutes of chatting that day, it was pretty clear that he was enjoying this movie star thing. Imp-like best describes Fred Tuttle. Short and shorter because of his arthritic stoop, he had a rubbery, sort of friendly face, always wore a ball cap, usually emblazoned with a big Fred on it, and large rectangular glasses over warm eyes that seemed to be alternately opening wide and squinting mischievously like a little kid, which, his age aside, he seemed most like. He had a short-step, bow-legged walk that reminded me of Walter Brennan, himself a New Englander, in To Have and Have Not. Fred seems like he just wandered off a vaudeville stage and ended up in Tunbridge, Vermont, says O'Brien. In reality, Fred Herman Tuttle was always very much of Tunbridge and nowhere else. The only son of an earlier line of Vermont dairy farmers, he dropped out of school in the 10th grade, joined the army, and served overseas during World War II. He returned to Tunbridge, got married, and gradually took over his dad's dairy farm, but it was a hard life. He had two kids, then two more that belonged to his third wife, the redoubtable Dottie. His health was lousy all along. By the time he was 70, 
with his own ailing 94-year-old dad living with him and nursing a broken hip, and he himself suffering from severe arthritis, Fred was forced to stop farming and to sell off his beloved herd of Jersey cows. He needed a knee replacement. He needed money. He needed a job. Observing all this, John O'Brien thought of the perfect job, in fantasy anyway. As neighbors go, Fred had others in Tunbridge whose backgrounds were certainly more similar to his than John O'Brien's. O'Brien graduated Harvard in 1985 and then returned to Tunbridge to help run his mom's small sheep farm there. But in between the feeding, herding, and shearing, O'Brien also found time to further his first love, filmmaking. O'Brien's interest is in a certain kind of movie making, a style he's described as community cinema. It involves using real people, not actors, playing themselves. Essentially, it's community theater on screen rather than on stage. Yes, it can be rough and raw, O'Brien allows, but when it's done well, it can have a real heart to it in a way that Broadway often can't. In his neighbor, O'Brien saw a rare and wonderful character to build a story around, Fred's story. So O'Brien set about writing a script that essentially mirrored Fred's life with a central twist and persuaded Fred to simply play himself. I've always said that Fred Tuttle is America's greatest method actor, O'Brien laughs. I mean, he's been in character for 75 years. In Man with a Plan, John O'Brien took the premise of Fred's real-life predicament and added a fictional plan to find the perfect job. No degree or prior experience required, a good salary, quality health care benefits, and no heavy lifting. All Fred had to do was get elected to Congress. <laughs> His catchy campaign slogan? I've spent my whole life in the barn. Now, I just want to spend a little time in the house. It's good, huh? Harvard guy. Low budget doesn't begin to describe Man with a Plan. Made for $100,000, or what Hollywood feature films spend in about a week in catering, O'Brien shot it all in Vermont with one scene in Washington, D.C., casting friends and neighbors who donated their time and services. True to O'Brien's style, the film is certainly rough and raw around the edges, but full of whimsy and heart, as well as authenticity. Not surprising, since its stars are all essentially playing themselves. Fred Tuttle plods along as a most improbable candidate, and then, even more improbably, wins the election. Man with a Plan became a cult hit and the highest grossing film in Vermont's history. Fred Tuttle became a celebrity of sorts. He appeared on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and Conan, sported a milk mustache and one of those Got Milk posters, and all over Vermont, small Spread Fred bumper stickers became as ubiquitous as ski racks. But the Fred Tuttle story soon had a real-life second act that was even more improbable than the first, and it involved a plot twist that even the most imaginative Hollywood screenwriter would very likely have dismissed as just too unbelievable. In 1998, Vermont's Democratic U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy was up for re-election. John O'Brien had a fun, creative idea. Fred Tuttle would run for the Republican nomination to challenge Leahy. After all, there was no real threat to the popular Leahy, and the short-lived campaign would create all kinds of great and free publicity for Man with a Plan, all of which turned out to be true, wildly so. Fred's opponent in the Republican primary, a transplanted Massachusetts businessman named Jack McMullen, was widely perceived as an opportunistic, carpet-bagging outsider who'd simply scoped out an easy race. So we thought, why not run a protest against him, recalls John O'Brien. We thought Vermont should be run by Vermonters, and what better Vermonter than Fred Tuttle? So in what can only be described as an extraordinary example of art imitating life imitating art, there was Fred, the candidate again, along with John, stumping around the state for real this time. Indeed, Fred's walker sported the same Elect Fred campaign poster that had been used for the movie. The words U.S. House had simply been taped over with U.S. Senate. <laughs> In one particularly memorable moment of the primary campaign, Tuttle and McMullen met for debate on Vermont Public Radio. It featured the following exchange, very likely unmatched in the annals of American politics. Fred, this is a milk production question, Jack. How many teats does a Holstein have and how many teats does a Jersey have? <laughs> McMullen, how many what, Fred? <laughs> Fred, teats, Jack, teats. How many teats does a damn cow have? <laughs> Alas, the correct answer, FOA, eluded 
Flatlander to McMullen, who promptly dug his hole deeper by mispronouncing eight of the ten Vermont town names that Fred put to him. Yeah. Either way, the point seems to have been made, and on September 8th, Jack McMullen was defeated. Fred Tuttle was Vermont's official Republican U.S. Senate nominee. <laughs> then, the real zaniness began. In one of his first public statements as nominee, Fred made it abundantly clear that negative ads, robocalls, and opposition research were things he and John O'Brien would not be trifling with. Oh, I like Leahy. He's a wonderful man, Fred happily volunteered. I'm sure he's going to win. To which he added cheerfully, but if you really want to see me go to Washington, you can always rent my movie. <laughs> Naturally, we hightailed it back up to Tunbridge to spend a few days on the campaign trail with Fred. We met early on a bright, crisp morning at Fred's house. As John helped Fred into his car, I lingered on the steps, and I asked Dottie Tuttle for her thoughts on things. Well, I won't vote for him, that's for sure, she said. <laughs> no? No. I know that may not be fair, but he's just not qualified. <laughs> A high-pitched voice piped up through the car window just below us. I heard that, Dottie, I heard that. <laughs> he says he heard that, I gestured to the car. Yeah, well, he knows how I feel, and I ain't leaving here. Dottie went back inside. I walked over and leaned into the car window. Fred, uh, your wife doesn't seem to like this uh, political stuff much, does she? No, not really. She's a wonderful person, but hey, who says I like it? But you're in it. I know I'm in it, he said with a high-pitched giggle. And off we went to a local elementary school where Fred would take questions from second graders. Ken, my photographer, and I got ahead of Fred and John to get a shot of Fred's reaction on entering the classroom. In honor of their now famous neighbor, Virtually every kid in the classroom, including the teacher, was wearing Fred's trademark blue jean coveralls. It was quite a sight. Fred walked through the door, stopped, stood there for a moment astonished. He looked at John, he looked back at the kids, he tilted his hat back on his head and rubbed his stubbly chin. Well, Jesus, look at that. <laughs> Don't you know? The students beamed. Fred seemed to bite his lower lip. It was a wonderful moment. The Q&A with the candidate was, well, entirely Fred-like. How does it feel running for Senate? A young girl asked. Oh, I'm kind of a big shot now, Fred smiled. Another student asked about the environment. Oh yeah, gonna help the environment, Fred nodded. Another promise, Fred, John cautioned. Have you made a lot of promises, Fred? The teacher asked sympathetically. Too many, Fred sighed. How much money have you spent in your campaign, Fred? I asked. What would you say, John? Sixteen dollars? About sixteen dollars? <laughs> O'Brien nodded. Yeah, about sixteen dollars. <laughs> The school children had their picture taken with Fred and went out to recess. I sat with him for a few moments on a pair of small desks. What if you're actually elected, Fred? I don't know, he smiled. My wife, she'll divorce me right off quick. Your wife says she's not going to vote for you. No, she's not going to vote for me. I don't blame her any. Eventually, Fred made it easy on his wife. He did something also unmatched in the history of American politics. He officially endorsed his opponent, Democrat Pat Leahy. <laughs> I saw him at some small town parade that fall, Senator Leahy recalls today, and he yelled over to me, don't worry, Pat, I ain't going to do nothing to hurt you. <laughs> In truth, Leahy and Tuttle had been fond of each other from their first meeting. Tunbridge is near Rygate, Vermont, where Leahy's mother was from. Fred knew many of the elder Leahy's friends. Fifteen years speaking by phone from his Senate office in Washington, it's clear how warmly Pat Leahy recalls both Fred and that crazy campaign. It's also clear what an uncanny and spot-on Fred Tuttle imitation he does. I had already committed to doing several candidates' nights with whoever the nominee turned out to be, says Leahy. And even though Fred endorsed me, I said, hey, Fred, let's go to these events together. He said, well, jeez him, Pat. I'd like to, but with my hip like this, I can't drive. So the senator chauffeured his erstwhile opponent, and their friendship deepened. Foregoing debates, Leahy persuaded Fred to join him instead in visiting schools all across Vermont that fall to speak with students. It became sort of a Pat and Fred's excellent adventure. It was right at the height of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, Leahy recalls with relish. And at this one elementary school, a little girl says to Fred, Fred, did you really kiss all those girls in the movie? And Fred says, by Jesus, I sure did, and I enjoyed it, too. I turned to a reporter, Leahy said, and I said, there is not another political candidate in America who would have just said that. <laughs> On election night in November 1998, although he received more than 20% of the vote, Fred Tuttle was handily defeated by his good friend, Pat Leahy. 
He called me afterwards, says Leahy. He said, by Jesus, Pat, I'm glad you won. I had a nightmare that I won and I was hiding out in the barn so no one would find me. <laughs> For years afterward, Leahy and Tuttle kept up their friendship. When Dottie Tuttle broke her hand, Leahy and his own wife would drive down to Tunbridge and bring supper to the Tuttles in Tupperware, the senator points out, so they could reheat it afterward. Thrifty, thrifty people, Vermonters. Fred and I sat up till almost midnight talking one night. He told me his biggest regret was quitting school. He loved children. He always told them not to do what he did, to stay in school. I asked Leahy what he thinks the essence of Fred Tuttle's unique appeal was. Well, Vermonters heard him and they knew he was authentic as they come. What you saw and heard was who he was and what you got. There was no guile whatsoever. He was nice. He was warm. There's a pause on the other end of the line. The easy, self-assured voice of the nation's second most senior senator and chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee trails off for a moment. At some point before he died, Leahy continues, he told me that the last years of his life, riding around the state, meeting school kids, talking to me, were the happiest years of his entire life. In 2003, at the age of 84, Fred Tuttle passed away at his home in Tunbridge, Vermont. And by Jesus, he was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. You can get a room by the hour, but she stayed the whole week. Nothing here seemed real to her, not even the name of the town, Kinnikinnik. She'd come here on her own with nothing but her backpack and more baggage than one so young should carry. There was nothing in that load she needed, just a little break, she told herself. That's all she needed. She made to fluff the pillow, and it was heavier than she expected. There she lay, with every fear and fault, half afloat in a broken boat in her midnight mind, blinking between the neon and the moon. Flotsam and jetsam. She threw some overboard willfully, some just refused to float. Tired as she was, she lay awake. And that old phone cracked with a jagged ring that she refused to answer. Or maybe she just didn't hear it through the noises gnawing at her head. A knock at the door brought her to. It was the motel man smelling of bed and saying, There's a guy here to see you. Says it's urgent. She clutched her backpack to her chest. She barked. I'm not here. Not this time. No. Not at the Blue Swallow Motel. How to save the world. Only the outlandish act will do. That clean white cloth your mother starched? Lop it off in rounded intervals and stamp its scalloped edge in designs as intricate as the newsprint smudging your prickled fingertips. No urgency, no a tempest bruise. Reel in your inky washing from the line. Ho oh, deep, true rose, while there's still time. And when the rain arrives and freezes, defy all reason. That handiwork of yours? An improvised bandage now, though quite unlike the ones the Baptist lady's sewing circle rolled. Use it to wrap the gash where the wind-lashed branch once grew. Stop circling the wagons. Try bales of Timothy or slain students' vacant desks instead. Think principle, not self-protection. 
since you've already plowed up that lovely ornamental lawn, plant vegetables there and eat them. Lead a procession. Harbor fugitives from injustice and invite them to dine by candlelight at your table until dawn. And before you go to bed, check again the progress of that wounded tree. Note how the prosthetic bark appears. So like lichen or fish scales or the chain mail hide of an armadillo, the impenetrable plates of a pangolin. How do you save the world? You breathe, you think, you move. You do what you can. Only this outlandish act will do. Build, build, build. Here are where the birds still sing. Do you prefer it chilled or do you need it in a ring? Build, build, build until it blooms and it hilts. Little, little bird, are you no longer filled? We offered you some big old quilts. Field, 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 where the sun and the moon span the same breadth of wing. No more clouds in the sky to shield one night we'll meet again soon. Here are where the birds still sing. Thank you.